Historically, the indications for endoscopic therapy have been what I call the three P's, palliation, prevention, and the prohibitive risk patient. So palliation is exemplified by stenting. So we are unclogging the lumen with the stent. For example, in esophageal cancer, we put an esophageal stent in. Prevention is exemplified by polypectomy. So this is a precancerous lesion. We remove it and we prevent it from becoming a cancer. And the prohibitive risk patient, well, that group is actually decreasing because surgery is becoming less invasive. This is a scalpel, which is no longer used. It's a laparoscope. But also, there have been significant advances in anesthesia, and that deserves to be underscored. So it's much safer for these patients to undergo surgery. But what we are seeing is a definite paradigm shift now. We are moving from endoscopy as an alternative to surgery to endoscopy as the primary treatment of choice. In other words, we're moving from a past era when endoscopy was complementary to surgery and other treatments, and now it's becoming competitive with surgery. So advanced endoscopic therapy, it sort of captures this idea of moving to endoscopy as a primary choice. And it falls into four categories, four buckets. Resecting neoplasia, that can be mucosal or it can be submucosa, mucosa below the, the mucosa. Ablation, it can be stenting, recanalizing the lumen, which we've been doing for a while, but there have been some advances here. And then the big advance is bypassing the lumen. So if we're gonna compete with the surgeons, we of course have to aim, we have to achieve a cure for the patient. That's what the surgeon achieves. We need to achieve that as well. And we know that the submucosa is the critical layer. So here you see the five layers of the GI wall. The submucosa is divided into three sublayers: SM1, SM2, and SM3. And the risk of lymph node metastases or vascular dissemination increases the deeper you go into the submucosa. We use the term deep submucosal invasion, or DSI, to signal that limit where our resection it may not be curative anymore. So we know that if we're above that cutoff limit for DSI, we have a high likelihood of cure. But if we're below, if, we're, if we have deep submucosal invasion, then the risk increases. And this cutoff limit, it will differ depending on which organ we're in, which part of the GI tract, but also what kind of cancer we're dealing with. Is it squamous cell cancer in the esophagus, for example, or adenocarcinoma? It differs. So for the esophagus, as a rule, it's 200 microns. That's the DSI. In the stomach, it's 500 microns. In the colon, it's 1,000 microns. Now, as a general rule, the DSI correlates with the transition of SM1 to SM2. So as long as the cancer is limited to SM1, there's a high probability of endoscopic cure. As an example, gastric cancer here. The DSI is 500, so you can see then that it's just starting to invade into SM2, and this is where we don't know if we can achieve a cure, because it may have disseminated into the lymph vessels and the blood vessels in the submucosa. I want to emphasize that as much as I love EUS, I was one of the very first uh, globally to start doing EUS, in fact I went to Europe because EUS the echoendoscope wasn't yet approved by the FDA, and the only place I could start doing EUS was in Europe. It is, however, very poor at staging submucosal invasion. So we do a great job looking at these five layers here that correlate with the histologic layers. We have bright and dark layers. We can discriminate T1 versus T2 versus T3 and T4, as you can show he see here. But we are very poor at discriminating T1A, which is mucosal invasion, from T1B, which is submucosal. 
In addition, we cannot differentiate the sublayers of the submucosa. And importantly, we're basically just seeing black and white images. We cannot differentiate neoplasia from inflammation. So I always give the patient the benefit of the doubt. It may look like there's submucosal invasion, but maybe it's just inflammation that accompanies the cancer. There are three different uh, terms used when we resect mucosal tumors or neoplasias. One is polypectomy, you've all heard that one. The second is mucosal resection, EMR. You probably have heard that one. You may have heard endoscopic submucosal dissection, which is ESD. Now, unfortunately, these three terms are often used interchangeably, but they are all distinct from one another. They differ in their indication, and they differ in the uh, level or the depth of resection. So for polypectomy, we're dealing with a raised polyp, and our level or our depth of resection is in the deep mucosa, maybe the superficial submucosa, but not deeper than that. EMR is performed uh, for flat polyps, and the depth of resection is in the deep submucosa. ESD also has a depth of resection that's in the deep submucosa. But the difference between using EMR and ESD is our suspicion that there may be high grade dysplasia or cancer involving the lesion. So if you suspect HGD or cancer, then ESD is the way to go. So how does EMR differ from ESD? the plane of resection is the same. It's the deep mucosa. What's different is the tool that we use for resection. We use a snare for EMR. We use a knife for ESD. EMR can be unblocked if it's relatively small, less than two centimeters in size. But it usually is piecemeal if it's larger than the size of the snare, namely larger than two centimeters whereas ESD is always on block. So a piecemeal resection looks like this on the left, and on block, you can see the entire lesion that has been cut out on block on the right, and you can imagine the pathologist prefers to receive, to receive the specimen on the right, because it's very tedious to evaluate at least the depth of resection for each of these tiny little pieces. Now what piecemeal cannot offer is a statement from the pathologist re regarding the horizontal margins, whether those are clear from cancer, whereas the on block specimen can offer a statement about the horizontal margins. But both the piecemeal and the on block will tell you the depth of involvement. For EMR, there are three what I call assisted methods. So you've probably heard of some of these as well. There's most, the most common is called the injection assisted. So we inject a solution in the submucosa, raise it up, and then we resect it. The second is ligation assisted. So we're sucking the lesion into a cap that's mounted on the tip of the endoscope. Then we deploy a band, and then we resect. The cap assisted is injecting first, then sucking the lesion into a cap attachment, and then cutting. Now, the ligation assisted also uses a cap, but the emphasis here is first placing the band and then cutting afterwards. Ligation assisted EMR is, in my opinion, it, it is one of the most elegant procedures we perform and so simple and quick, so we love it. So we start by sucking the lesion into the cap here. You can see there are multiple bands here, so we can do this piecemeal if needed. Then we deploy the band, then we deploy the snare below the band, and then we resect the lesion, and then you see the post-EMR defect. Submucosal dissection is a completely different animal, if you will. It is a completely different procedure. It's very tedious, very labor-intensive, very time-consuming but it does allow us to get an on block resection. And we have various sophisticated, refined dissecting knives. All of these were developed in Japan where ESD was developed. 
to perform this. And the principle is very simple. We make a cut around the perimeter of the tumor. We dissect under the tumor. Then it looks like this after the resection and we have our en bloc specimen. We often use what's called the tunnel method. So we're actually tunneling underneath the tumor with our endoscope and dissecting. So it's dissection versus the term resection, which is done with a snare. What are the indications for ESD in the esophagus? So this is from a publication from this year published by the European Society of Gastrointestinal Endoscopy, ESGE. It was just updated. And it's indicated for any patient with high-grade dysplasia or cancer that's larger than two centimeters. If it's larger than two centimeters, you need to do ESD, period. Number two, if you suspect some mucosal invasion, for example, their central depression or their irregular uh, vessels. So those are the indications for ESD. If the endoscopist is not using ESD for this, these two groups of patients, then they're not following the current guidelines. What about the stomach? The indications for ESD in the stomach are first any dysplastic lesion, any, larger than one centimeter, provided it is non-ulcerated, it's differentiated on histology, and the depth is limited to SM1. So in the stomach, that's 500 microns, as I mentioned before. Now, if it's ulcerated, then we're limiting the use of ESD to lesions that are smaller than three centimeters. If it's undifferentiated, and, and, so both of these must apply, and intramucosal, so not invading more deeply, it's, it's poorly differentiated, but limited to the mucosa, then you can do ESD if it's smaller than two centimeters. So if it's larger than two centimeters, you need to send that patient to the surgeon. That currently is not within the scope of what we should be doing for cure, because our goal is the same as that of the surgeon. We want to cure the patient. ESD is not recommended in the duodenum. ESD carries a very high risk of perforation in the duodenum. The wall is very thin, it's very vascular, it's very easy to perforate, therefore we should perform EMR there. Resection by EMR is considered curative if the pathology shows that it's differentiated, there's no lymphovascular invasion, and there's no grade two or three budding. So you look at the pathology report and you see if you fulfill those three criteria. And if yes, then you've achieved a likely cure. Just an example to show you what this looks like. This is a fairly large lesion. It's precancer, it's just an adenoma. And this is how it looks after we've resected it. We can use any of those methods that I uh, previously showed you. EMR methods, correct? And then here, this is how it looks at one month, and this is at three months. So it was a curative resection. We always get biopsies from the scar base afterwards in our follow-up. Remember, too, that the ampulla vater is located in the second portion of the duodenum, and these adenomas can involve the ampulla, so we may need to perform ampulectomy. Now, really, it's papillectomy, but we call it ampulectomy. Ampulectomy is what surgeons perform. We perform papillectomy, but you can see here this large tumor that's engulfing the ampulla, and this is how it looks after we've resected the papilla and the surrounding duodenal wall. And this is the appearance at three months. Here's the opening to the CBD and you see bile just flowing out of it. Now the ESD tunnel method is also used to resect subepithelial tumors. We call these sets now. We shouldn't call these submucosal tumors uh, because we don't know for sure that these originate from the submucosa. That's an actual layer. So we call it subepithelial. And we like to use this method when the set is potentially originating from the muscularis propria, which is the outermost layer, which means that if we resect that, we've created a perforation, a hole in the wall. So the tunnel method involves making a small incision called a mucosotomy higher away from where the set is. So here in the esophagus, for example, four centimeters above the tumor, here it is. And then we tunnel in the submucosa. We create this so-called third space. And then we can cut this tumor out 
And we can do it full thickness now. We can have a hole. We're looking at the lung. We're looking at the heart. But we know that there is limited exposure, provided we then close the opening to that tunnel afterwards. So there is some exposure, but the exposure is only to the submucosal space, not the intraluminal esophageal space, which obviously is heavily contaminated. So you can see some pictures, some cartoons of how that looks, how we work in that third space. We actually call this now third space endoscopy. And some have called this the revival or the resurrection of notes, although this really isn't notes, which would be going outside the GI tract. Now, there is another way of performing a true non-exposed full thickness resection. And that is with this device. It's a cap that's mounted on the tip of the scope and we call it the uh, FTRD, full thickness resection device. It's a very clever device. Now, the limitation is the size of the lesion that you can resect. It's generally limited to at most two centimeters in size because it needs to be aspirated into this cap attachment here. But the idea is very simple. We retract the tumor and the wall. So we're inverting it into the cap, a full thickness retraction and inversion. Then we ligate with this bear claw ligator. Here you see the bear claw mounted on the cap. So we deploy that and you see it here after deployment. It's below the tumor. Then we resect, there's a snare that's also preloaded onto the cap. We then resect the tumor above, above the ligation. So the ligation ensures that we don't have a hole into the peritoneal space or the mediastinal space. So it's a very elegant way of performing a non-exposed full thickness resection. However, it's limited by the size of the lesion. Now we can perform now, thanks to the development and availability of very novel uh, closure devices, uh, a full thickness resection followed by immediate closure of our hole. So for example, a GIST tumor, we can just resect that and then immediately suture the, uh, the edges together. So really acting like a surgeon here, we have this uh, a needle, a suture needle that we can mount on the tip of the scope. It's a curved needle. There's an anchor here at the tip and we just throw this anchor back and forth. The anchor is attached to a suture and that's how we can then close this defect after resecting. There's also now a helix anchor. So this is a helix that we rotate into the wall and then it's attached to a suture. And there are four of these anchors that we can deploy and that's how we can close the hole. So very elegant. And this is just showing you a gist tumor and this is how it looks after resection. See, there's a hole here. This, you're looking at the extra intestinal space here. I don't know, liver maybe. And then we can close that hole immediately with our suture device. So that's this device up here. And there's the curved needle. You can see the suture. And here it is after full closure. So it's really a very nice, robust closure. The indications for full thickness resection are subepithelial tumors, specifically gist tumors and neuroendocrine tumors, because these tend to originate from the deeper layers and deeply invasive tumors, T1B and T2 cancers in high surgical risk patients. And these are the patients where we definitely want the oncologist to be involved because we expect that there's going to be some adjuvant therapy afterwards. Just a couple words about ablation. We've been doing this for a long time, but there's been a lot of new developments here. Radio frequency, we have all sorts of new ablation probes here and the, de the degrees of circumference that we can treat have gone all the way up to 360. Here with cryotherapy, we're now doing that through a balloon. It's very nice because we don't have to worry about overinflating with uh, gas, whether it's nitrogen or CO2. And argon plasma, that's been around for a long time. So these are two non-contact methods, and this is a contact method. But the, the, the emphasis in terms of differentiating ablation from EMR is the depth of treatment. So the treatment with ablation is at most into the deep mucosa here, 
And with EMR, we're getting into the deep submucosa. So the indications for ablation, for cure now, remember, this is not palliation, this is for cure, would be non-nodular dysplasia, meaning flat, right? Non-nodular dysplasia, or if there's post-resection recurrence. We often use it there because everything's so scarred and you can't really re-resect in scar tissue. So for example, a patient with Barrett's, let's say, with a nodule, we would use an EMR method, such as the CAP method here, to resect this nodular raised area. Here you can see the defect after resection. Then, because we've got Barrett's around the circumference, but it's flat, we can use the 360 RFA balloon to treat that. So that's how the two complement one another. A couple words about stenting, been around a long time, but continues to evolve with new stent materials, designs, more flexible, less migration risk. Delivery systems have improved. These are thinner. These pass through the endoscope channel, so we don't have to work alongside uh, the, uh, the catheters anymore. Easier deployment. These have new, better coatings and uh, easier to remove. In addition, because migration is such a problem with these SEMs, especially if these patients receive adjuvant therapy. The, the lumen opens up and then the stent migrates, which is maybe a good sign because it means the tumor is being effectively treated and shrinking, but that stent can impact in the GI tract as it passes. So we have devices now. This is the bear claw that I showed you earlier. We can use that to fixate the stent uh, in the part of the GI tract we want to stand, or we can suture it in. Same technology. Now, stenting carries significant risk, despite all of these improvements, and it, to, the, to the extent that in 2021, the ESG has stated that SEMS is not recommended before surgery or adjuvant therapy. So it's right here in black and white, so to speak, black and yellow, and the risks of stenting are the migration and impaction, they get blocked they, with food or ingrowth, and the trauma and ulceration that it can cause. And so this is a perfect segue to the last topic, which is uh, bypassing the lumen. So we've been using an enteral SEMS to treat patients with gastric outlet obstruction, but it's been fraught with complications to the point that this randomized controlled trial comparing a surgical gastrojejunostomy with an enteral SEMS showed in fact that those patients undergoing the stenting really had only the advantage of being able to resume eating sooner. Otherwise, the risks were all much higher, the complication or adverse event rate was much higher. So major complications much higher significantly in the stented patients, recurrent obstructive symptoms significantly higher in the stented patients, and reinterventions required. So these patients have to undergo further procedures significantly higher in the stented patients. For that reason, we have been thinking about how we endoscopists might be able to create a gastroenterostomy, at least, bypass the lumen. And this has been, you, uh, Mike mentioned that I, I love innovation. So I came up with this concept for a lumen opposing metal stent called a LAMS. Two big flanges here on the outside with a short saddle in between, it's just one centimeter. The idea is to hug two lumens in apposition with one another. And so those lumens could be the stomach lumen and the small bowel lumen that we can create a gastroenterostomy, either duodenostomy or jejunostomy. So we puncture with a hot device with thermal current, and we enter into the small intestine from the stomach, then we deploy this LAMS, distal anchor here in the small bowel, proximal anchor in the stomach. You see after deployment, and it's immediate, we have an immediate anastomosis. You see the efferent and afferent limbs and this is the study that I published first in animals uh, to get the FDA clearance for this. And it shows here the lambs opposing the stomach and the jejunum together. So again, this, the steps here using a lambs, an obstructed lumen. This is a patient with an ingrown SEMS, completely blocked. Couldn't eat, nausea, vomiting, just miserable. 
Then we, we place our catheter for filling of the small bowel because we need to see the small bowel very well. And the water makes things black so we can see everything well. Then we puncture the small bowel with our hot cyst delivery system, which I also developed that allows a one-step entry into the small bowel with immediate deployment of the lambs. Then we uh, deploy the lambs, and here you can see the gastroenterostomy. And this is a publication from our group from 2021. We compare, now this is historical, it's not a randomized controlled trial, but it's a good study. Uh, I can vouch for that. Uh, we compared EUS-guided gastroenterostomy versus surgical gastrojejunostomy, 50 patients with malignant gastric outlet, outlet obstruction. And the EUSGE was superior in terms of a shorter procedure time, significantly uh, shorter. You can see here the, de the uh, uh, details. Faster oral intake for these patients. Actually, they literally immediately can start eating. And shorter hospital stay. We do this as an outpatient now. So they're not even a hospital stay anymore. And this is also important because I know there's some administrators in the audience, lower total cost by 50% or more. So in summary, here we are with 14 seconds. Firstly, resecting neoplasia. So on block is mandatory for high grade dysplasia and cancer. We can use EMR or we can use ESD. If we use EMR, it just has to be on block. In other words, it will need to be limited to relatively small lesions that we can fully capture in the snare. EMR plus minus ablation is used for Barrett's dysplasia. ESD with the tunnel method is used to resect subepithelial tumors, especially GISTs and neuroendocrine tumors. And full thickness resection is used for GIST tumors and neuroendocrine tumors. In other words, you need to have a strategy in place to protect against contamination of the outside space. Ablating neoplasia, RFA, or cryo for flat Barrett's uh, dysplasia, and a stent uh, to recanalize the lumen. Many great advances, but you must monitor carefully for adverse events, and it's recommended to avoid this as bridge therapy. So it's fine if this is strictly for palliation. But if you're thinking of sending the patient to surgery or maybe giving neoadjuvant therapy with surgery later, I would avoid a SEMS. And finally, bypassing the lumen. This is, I think, a great advance. Uh, really enables us to do procedures that basically allow us to extend our reach outside the gastrointestinal tract, not only to the small bowel, but now we're performing internal gallbladder drainage, cholocysto, do it in ostomies. We're uh, draining the bile duct, uh, all sorts of lesions. If we can see it with EUS, we can drain it. Thank you very much.